It's good to see everyone out here this evening. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us for this very, very important discussion. As Pat said, I am an art lover. Uh, I, I, I had to tell my family I was t I'm on an art diet because I have so many pieces of work works at home. Uh, and, then I, and then I meet Gerald and I want to get some more. So, <laughs> But uh, let me uh, say that we have some esteemed panelists here and what I would like for each of them to do is to just give us a brief, tell us a little bit about yourself, just a little bit about yourself. And so what we will do is, um, but before I do that, I just want to say we've got some students in the house. We have students from Medill, we have some students from True Star Media, and also Columbia College, and we, we thank them for, for joining us. Let's give them a big round of applause, because it's important for the, for the students to really take up this issue, because it's a very important issue when you talk about what's happening in our community. And so now we will have our, our panelists introduce themselves, and we'll start with Gerald Griffin, who is to my right. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Gerald Griffin, uh, Chicago artist, born and raised here, uh, product of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, art gallery owner. I'm a painter, a sculptor, and a writer. And um, been doing this for quite a number of years, coming up on 30, so uh, I think I'm getting the hang of it. And he has a beautiful studio on 82nd and... 82nd and Princeton. Princeton. Yes. Yes. Very nice. Thank you. We also have Dwight White II right here. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Dwight. Of course. Um, Dwight White. I um, attended Northwestern University, graduated from the School of Medill, so the students who are in the house, okay, I see a couple there. Um, <laughs> I have been a professional artist for the past six years. Um, I started my career here in the city of Chicago and have, to, have had the opportunity to expand beyond as well. Um, it's truly a blessing every single day. Um, what I do is basically document history um, by utilizing my creativity. So that's a little bit about me, my practice, um, and the style of art that I create, and um, I call it spontaneous realism. Something that's very um, thoughtful. It's something that takes place very quickly, but at the end of the day, um, the goal is for people to connect with it emotionally. So it's a little bit about me and my art. And you have a piece uh, out in the courtyard. Yes, I, I do have a piece in the courtyard that was done during um, the pandemic and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, Again, very spontaneous out on the streets of Chicago, and it's really my contribution um, to the streets and to the community. And then I think in the pictures there, there's one of your pieces that's up on, is it Dearborn? Um, I believe there, there is one on Dearborn. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that piece is on Ida B. Wells. On Ida B. Wells, mm -hmm. okay, very nice, yeah. very nice. Thank you so much. Of course. And last but not least, we have Professor Robert Hansard from Columbia College. How's it going? Uh, Professor Robert Hansard. Uh, let's see, I study West African and African American and what is called Atlantic history. If you've ever heard of this sort of approach where we look at West Africa, the Americas, and Europe sort of through a different lens. So that's been my approach. That's sort of what I've taught and researched and published, uh, you know, books and other things on. Um, I'm excited to be here to participate with these artists. Very nice. So let's start with the artwork that is surrounding us. And this particular piece is a Carol Walker exhibition, and it's called Presenting Negro Scenes Drawn Upon My Passage Through the South and Reconfigured for the Benefit of Enlightened Audiences Wherever Such May Be Found by myself, Mrs. K.E.B. Walker, colored. And I'm going to ask um, Gerald to discuss this because his piece right behind us, the bust of uh, our Vice President Kamala Harris, and he's going to talk about both of the pieces of artwork. Gerald. Okay. Um, I've, been a, um, I've been an admirer of Kara's work for a while. Um, thematically, uh, a lot of her work is in the same vein as mine in terms of um, utilizing these narratives of the past, 
uh, from her standpoint, it's more of the, you know, kind of this hurtful stereotypical uh, images, um, kind of cartoonish images that um, our families and generations have become accustomed to seeing in the media and on and on these portrayals of black history and kind of putting those on the forefront um, in silhouettes, which are almost like shadows. And I thought it was, you know, kind of ironic that the light on uh, my bust of uh, Kamala Harris is actually casting a shadow on top of her silhouettes, because my approach is more so um, using references from the past, from that hurtful past, and juxtaposing those with contemporary um, situations and ideas about who we are from an identity standpoint, from a, um, from a societal standpoint. So the series, um, a current series that I'm working on is called Our Historical Narratives. And it started from a, uh, a reaction to the uh, Black Lives uh, Matter protest and the destruction of monuments, these hurtful monuments, and really the, the um, public lynching um, that we all witnessed, you know, nine minutes on, on uh, worldwide on TV. And the, the, um, the immediate reaction from people was, you know, a, a remembrance of this, um, of this oppression and lashing out and trying to um, uh, tear down those hurtful images that surround us. And I thought, what would be a, a creative social response to this situation? Um, our story is often untold in the public space. Uh, historically, it has been, and many of the romanticized monuments that we see are a skewed reality or partial reality of what history really was. But it is still a reference to what history was. And so when those things are taken away or destroyed completely, now not only is our story not there, their story is there's no story there. And we still don't have a voice. We still don't have a representation. So I decided to do this series of sculptures um, that would speak to that. And initially my idea was if you saw a romanticized sculpture of Thomas Jefferson, you know, he's known for the Declaration of Independence, a great president, statesman, but he also had another side. He was a slave owner. He had um, kids by a slave who he had had relations with, who, he, who remained in slavery along with his, his, uh, his white kids. So there's a whole different, um, idea of who this individual is. So we only see the one perspective and we don't get the other story. We don't get our history. Um, I thought that we could create some, uh, that I would create some monuments that next to that uh, two times life-size sculpture of Thomas Jefferson would be a sculpture of Sally Hemings and her children as well, juxtaposed within the same space. And now you're seeing a different side or the full story of Thomas Jefferson and it tells a different story. And it brings that, that history in full and for a contemporary audience who are struggling with a situation like um, George Floyd, it gives a reference, a historical reference as to why something like that can happen and why something like that still happens. Because there's a whole generation who may not be familiar with a lot of these figures that I'm speaking of, Sarah, Sally Hemsley or even Frederick Douglass. Um, his story is, um, is lightly told, but there's a, there's a whole history there that um, I think the youth can relate to because most of his, you know, his greatest achievements when he, was, when he was young, he was a runaway slave, he taught himself to read, he was an abolitionist. So my um, interpretation of Frederick Douglass is the young Frederick Douglass, not the gray-haired, you know, bearded, this young man who behind his back is holding a broken shackle and chains and in the front he's holding the lapel of his suit and it's showing that transition from the past to the present but it also talks about how as a youth his actions made a difference in the world and just like those Black Lives Matters youth their actions can make a difference in the world and to see that in the public space I think is beneficial to them. So I happen to know that you believe that the statues that have been taken down, you don't, you're, not a, you're not for that. You don't think that the statues should be taken down. Well, 
Of course, I don't think this statue should be taken down because they tell a history. And although it's a hurtful history, uh, it's a history that we need to know. So there's, there's this saying, never forget, never forget. Uh, I talk to my Jewish friends, they say the Holocaust, never forget. You talk to people about 9-11, they say, you know, 9-11 was so hurtful, we'll never forget. When you talk to people about the transatlantic slave trade, they say, well, you know, why don't, why don't we forget about that? But we shouldn't forget that as well, because we need to understand that, learn from that, and grow from that. So my series, Paradigm Shift, is understanding that paradigm, understanding this idea of um, this episode that happened within our collective uh, histories mm -hmm. and then moving beyond that. Professor, do you agree that the statues that they have been toppling shouldn't be? Do you believe they should still stand? Yeah, I do. I, I like uh, what uh, Gerald is talking about in terms of this sort of uh, paradigm. And, and it even speaks to the Kara Walker stuff if, if, if you've had the chance to look at it um, because they're images that, you know, they invite you to take them in a range of ways. They're literal to some degree. They want you to think about it euphemistically. They want you to think about it in terms of symbols, maybe. Just, just take them in. Uh, uh, um, but, you know, you, 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 she's speaking to some things. And that's why I think the, the images are very rough and raw. She's reminding us, um, as Gerald mentioned, about Jefferson and notes on the state of Virginia, where, where, where he can essentially say that he doesn't believe that black people could be, should be, have freedom, right? Uh, um, so the, the problems of that, uh, um, but there has to be a dialogue. There has to be, uh, and, and stuff like what, what is happening. Um, we, we looked at an example, we were talking about that Artnet article um, where the artist made a sort of complimentary piece to counter what he saw um, was a problematic depiction of people. Um, this was in uh, San Francisco uh, of, of a New Deal piece of uh, and it negative, the life of George Washington it was called, and it negatively showed African Americans and Native Americans together. And so the artist uh, um, in the 1930s initially presented it as a conversation in its own right relative to the New Deal and legacies of this sort of whitewashing of history. So then along comes someone in the 60s um, as part of uh, Oakland and the San Francisco, you know, the Black Panther movement comes along and looks at this art and said, I got something else to add to it. And he puts up the multi-ethnic heritage. So now today you get to 2021 and here are people saying, tear it down. But see, if you tear his down, um, you tear down the 60s artists too. So there's a piece around dialogue and dialogue that needs to be, to be had. Art is asking you to critically engage it uh, in, in that way. What do you think, Dwight? I mean, I think to both of the points that have been made um, and specifically to the last point around dialogue, um, I think that's a significant point, um, especially when you think about you know, what public art can do, as Gerald mentioned. Um, it starts conversations, it allows people to share perspectives and also allows for growth. Um, but it all kind of starts with that initial point, and that point lives in history. Um, then we have opportunity in the present time to reshape narratives, retell stories, and hopefully change the future. And so that is a huge part of art. Um, art allows us to have that dialogue, it allows us to share those stories, and allows us to uplift our people, specifically on the streets. And that's how a lot of my, me and my peers have been able to use street art. Um, it's something that lives in the neighborhood. It's something that um, people can respond to, share their perspectives, and ultimately, um, you know, change systems. And so I think that's the true ultimate power of art and perspective. Do you think that we really need the monuments? I mean, when most of the monuments that we see around, they were put up in the like 1800s, 1900s, most of them. It's a different time now. Do we really need to erect monuments like, like the ones that we already have, Professor? I mean, again, I, I think it's, the, the conversation's got to be there. But a dynamic conversation has to be there. I mean, the, the Balbo Monument was uh, a, a gift from Mussolini, right? Um, and then you got, uh, you know, the Columbus Monument. And I know that there's close connections culturally there, but. I, I don't know. I mean, there, there have to be other reasons to build monuments besides war, <laughs> um, uh, you know, the success of uh, maybe sort of, if we want to say white supremacy to some degree, uh, um, by what the monuments are suggesting. There, there have to be other ways. 
um, where there have to be other sort of um, uh, uh, representations. And I think the dialogue piece is the best way. If you have a piece that's problematic and, and maybe has some history to it, allowing an artist or a group of folks to come and, and sort of resituate that piece, to me, I think is the most relevant way to go. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it's great to have uh, monuments and art pieces uh, within your community. But I think it's also paramount to have those within the main public square. So, so much of the art that is done by African-American artists, and that speaks to our history, that's, you know, integral to the, human, to the human story, is in black neighborhoods. So you go to a black neighborhood, you see a mural, you see a painting, you see a sculpture. But the, me going to the Art Institute and traveling around the world, um, traveling to different museums and you know, the main public squares, there's always art that doesn't reflect me. That historical art and even the contemporary art, it doesn't speak to my sensibilities, it doesn't speak to me as a, so that sends a message to me and to my community that you don't belong in these spaces. You belong in that neighborhood. That's where you can go and feel comfortable and see a, a piece of art that talks to you and talks to you. But the public square should be the public square within our own particular neighborhoods and cultures, yeah, there'll be things that celebrate us and our history and our culture, but in the shared space, it should be shared representation. So I would love to see, um, just like you have the Columbus statue and the Thomas Jefferson and on and on and all these big monuments in the main public square, that there is a representation of African-American art, our history, our story, our narratives, Dusabo, we're in the DuSabo Museum, we're in the Roundhouse. Um, DuSabo was uh, a founder of Chicago. There's a, a bust of DuSabo on the bridge uh, on uh, Michigan Avenue, which is small. And maybe a block down the street is a full life-size figure of Harry Carey. And what that says to me is, okay, in terms of importance, we look at size in terms of importance, right? It's a small building, that's a huge building. It, the the Sabo uh, monument is almost, if, if you weren't looking for it, you'd never even see it. There should be a two times life-size sculpture of Du Sabo in the park, in Grant Park, on Michigan Avenue, to speak to the contributions of black people to American history, to the, uh, creation of Chicago and on and on. So what, so why is that? I mean. Well, those stories have been intentionally left out. I learned just part of this series, this series evolved from a series, uh, I did, I had a solo museum show in, um, in Indiana, Art Museum of Lafayette, for a series of works, a series of poems, started out as 30 poems, and then I did a visual interpretation of those poems in paintings or sculpture. And the title of the series was uh, Paradigm Shift. And it's about this idea of shifting our paradigm, shifting our consciousness about how we view ourselves, how we fit into society, deal with race and, and with ideas of race and ethnicity and identity. And um, while I was doing research for this, this series and working on some of the, the uh, figurative sculpture pieces, um, I came across this story about the Statue of Liberty and the history of the Statue of Liberty being it was a monument that was dedicated to the United States after the Emancipation Proclamation to signify America living up to its promise of equality and liberty and inclusion and, you know, emancipation. And, um, you know, it's been said that the original monument was of a black woman who had broken uh, manacles and, you know, shackles and chains at her feet. Did you all know that? Did, who, who knew that? Okay, all right. And um, so I guess the, the, you know, the country didn't want that to be the lasting image of America. So the, the monument changed to Persephone. She's holding the light of truth, walking into the underworld. But the artist insisted that the sculpture would maintain the shackles and chains on its feet. So on the Statue of Liberty, it's broken shackles and chains under her drapery on her feet. It's on a two-story building, so you can't see it standing there uh, at, you know, at where the sculpture is. If you're far away, you know, most of the uh, I images I see are from far away, and you don't see it, but they're there. And so in this sculpture series I did, most of the figurative pieces feature this motif. 
You have a figure who's sitting on an American flag with a broken shackle and chains at her feet to signify the significance of black history to the Statue of Liberty. If I had learned that in grade school, that the Statue of Liberty had something to do with the history of black people in this country, that could change my perspective about how I feel about the Statue of Liberty and how I feel about the country. White kids don't know that story. Black kids don't know that story. They didn't Those are the that histories in, and narratives that need to be told. I, I never knew that until you told me that. I, I did not know that. And it's sad that these are the kinds of things that we're not taught. Mm -hmm. And so how do we change that? How do we, you know, when, when the whole thing happened with George Floyd and the whole racial unreckoning, everybody was like, we got to change this. And how do we feel now? Do you feel like we're actually still changing things? Do you feel like there's still a momentum in that direction? And if there isn't, then what does that say for the art that we decide we're going to put up in our community? I mean, I think there is still momentum. I think people are still very energized. I feel like people are also very inspired to see how communities started to come together, right? Um, I think a lot of the conversations that unfortunately are being had here in 2021 um, are allowing us to think about arts differently, thinking about this movement differently, and also to the points that are being made, look at our past and look what we've done before. Um, how do we utilize the tools and resources we have today um, to band together and continue this movement? Um, I think the George Floyd protest for a moment made everybody stop and think. Um, but at the same time, uh, there was a lot of emotion attached to that, right? There was a lot of anger. Um, there's a lot of struggle, um, even if we want to go into like our mental health and what that could do for communities. Um, art is the thing not only that, you know, allows people to heal, but also, like I said, starts that narrative, starts to tell those stories. Um, and I think that's extremely important uh, for our community in order to keep the momentum going. You have to see it. Um, it has to be in plain sight. Um, the public has to be reminded consistently of what is taking place in the world, um, and artists are a huge part of documenting that. I'm, I, I don't have the answer to this question, but um, when you see public art out there, I mean, how does it get there? Who decides which pieces are going to be in which neighborhoods, in which public squares? And when we're talking about telling the full story, do we even know how our voice can be heard? I know that after the Columbus statues were dismantled, uh, the city uh, convened a, a monuments uh, working group where they were discussing and looking at questionable monuments around town and what to do with it. And as far as I know, at this point, no decisions have been made. There were some public comments that people could, you know, make talk about what they were interested in, but. Do we even really have a voice in this? I mean, to me, it seems like it's all about who has the money, Professor. Yeah, I think, as you rightfully say, the money plays. Um, it, it sort of forces maybe what is represented. That's, that has been the feature of the monuments and their selection um, going back to the 18th and 19th, 19th century. Um, it was who had money, who had resources, who had power um, that are in position to sort of say um, what, what we view and, and how we represent and remember history. Um, and, and I do think we have a voice. I think it's, it's, I think it's been, I mean, things have been generating it. I mean, the Floyd and the issues that happened with George Floyd was just uh, the latest for many folks. Um, so it's just, uh, the, it's, it's great that it's erupting some now. And I think that that's part of the dynamic uh, of the dialogue. It's gonna get rough and tumble. People are gonna say things are overly political. We might miss the, the real history in some places, but that's why we gotta be talking about it. So we can have a real dialogue so we can really engage it in the right sort of context. Um, but I, I, I think that as long as we're in a space where we're critically asking questions and thinking critically about our, our, our experience, our culture, the thing's going. It's moving. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that um, personally, as an artist, um, while there are, there, are, um, there are entities in place who decide where artists, what art goes where, what's recognized, what's done, what isn't. Um, I'm of the mind to just do it. So um, what, do you mean? what I mean is, uh, so I did a proposal, when I first had the idea for this, I, I did a proposal um, 
called Our Historical Narratives. I sent one to the mayor's office. I sent one to my state senator. And I was like, you know, here's a way, okay, you, you, we're dealing with the National Guard and police going down, trying to surround and stop people from pulling down a monument. Here's a way that we can deal with um, our stories not being there. People are locked in their houses, COVID is going on, there's no jobs. Artists could be hired to create these monuments, put our stories out there, create a balance in those narratives, and that would address people feeling as if uh, they're being stepped on, which, you know, George Floyd just brought to the forefront. And um, I waited for a response. I didn't get any response. So, um, and it was just written out. So I started doing the sculptures as maquettes. So I did, uh, the first one I did was Kamala Harris. And this was before she even uh, had the nomination uh, as a vice presidential candidate. I thought it was significant, significant that this, you know, this woman of uh, black and Indian heritage was running for president and she was a significant candidate who could possibly, you know, be chosen. And, um, and she's, you know, uh, HBCU graduate, on and on and on. So I thought that her story speaks to kind of the evolution, this movement's evolution of, of um, the black um, awakening movement in, from the 60s, uh, how that has, you know, moved us forward to this point. And um, so I just started working on these pieces. And once they're there, they're, they exist. It's not an idea in my head. So whether or not, uh, and I have proposals to do funding for the two times life-size Obama piece that I did a maquette, um, you know, one-third life-size maquette of, I did a, a full bust of Frederick Douglass. If those pieces don't get the funding from the city or whoever to be made, I'm gonna make them anyway. I'm gonna put them in a public space anyway because um, there was a time when uh, the black community, right after the emancipation, was segregated and not given support and not given anything to, to build. And yet, we, from nothing, they built, you know, um, they built T-Town, you know, they built Bronzeville. They built all of these different, you know, um, societies that were successful and growing, doctors and on and on and on. And uh, the reaction was almost like the uh, January 6th reaction where people just came and, you know, bombed those places and, you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma and tore those places down. And that spirit is still very much alive today. We're battling with it. It caused George Floyd. It caused the January 6th. It caused these things to take place. And it's something that um, I think still exists because we tend to ignore the elephant in a room. An elephant in a room being the, um, the continued oppression of the black community. And it's always kind of swept under the rug, and, but it always comes to the surface. It's almost like a, a cyclical. And until we address some of these things, and we address them through art, we address them through conversation, we address them through um, dialogue, then they'll, they'll continue to haunt us. Those ghosts will continue to haunt us. We, we go ahead. Wait. Yeah, no, I was, I was just gonna say um, you know, some, some powerful words that you just presented there around just, just doing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think for me as a young artist, one of the most inspiring moments that I saw, or even for myself, during the during the pandemic and during the protests was starting to view the world a little bit differently starting to understand that the city of chicago was my gallery like mm -hmm. i wasn't waiting for the next gallery to give me permission exactly. to showcase my work or exhibit um, on a certain scale mm -hmm. um, the city every single board i saw in the city that became mine right. owned it because i had a message to share mm -hmm. and so i think that is such a, a powerful statement because a lot of times as artists, you have to wait for your next opportunity, or at least that's how we're taught. Exactly. Um, where, you know, during this time of sitting and thinking, you got to shape your own perspective all over again, mm -hmm. got to step out into the world and make the city your oyster. And so I was able to produce the most work I've ever done in my career. Mm -hmm. um, none of it that 
was intended to end up in galleries or yeah. um, didn't imagine it being mm -hmm. outside a DuSable. It was more so that, you know, understanding like, what's my role? Yeah. Um, how do I contribute to society? How do I contribute to the voice of the unheard? Mm -hmm. um, that is something that as artists, um, you know, we do have the opportunity to do and you do have an opportunity to leave a visual impact. Um, and a lot of those pieces that were going up on around the streets weren't even going to be permanent. Right, <laughs> um, right. But you knew that it had a purpose. Well, I mean, that's one reason why I try to work in time-tested uh, materials. So I work in oil paints because they're oil paintings from, you know, 15th century. I work in bronze because, you know, those, those lions in front of the Art Institute have been there for, you know, over a century. These pieces will outlive me and probably my children. I want to leave something that has a lasting impact that speaks to this idea that we were here. So I'm an artist. Um, I write, I sculpt, I paint, and it's as natural to me as breathing. So if someone said, okay, well, you know, I'll give you permission when to breathe, it, it doesn't work. I'm going to breathe all the time. I'm going to create all the time, whether or not it's with permission or not. I'm going to create these pieces. I'm going to have that dialogue. I feel it's important. The conversation is important, even more important than the finished work. What, what conversation does that finished work elicit? Uh, how does it speak to my generation and future generations, not only from our collective culture, but from the human family? And how do we, you know, how do we open up those dialogues and start to realize that we are more alike than we are different? So the, the title of this session is Telling a Full Story of American History via Public Art. And I would like to ask each one of you, is that possible? Is it possible, Professor, to tell the full story? I think you, you begin the story. The story, uh, you know, art and aesthetic is part of how we can um, educate and think about this. Yes, I think as a historian, I would say you want to look closely at documents. You want to look at material. Um, you want to look at, you know, news, newspaper, what, what have you. There's a range of ways you want to understand a moment in history and, and make sense of a past. But I, I think art helps people get engaged with more critical things. Um, they, 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 you know, um, and just imagine the images that we could put up that could get people to think more critically about, 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 about things. You know, I mean, to me, you know, in the context of Haiti and things, Toussaint Louverture comes to mind to me. I mean, it just does. I mean, if you're talking about a counter narrative to the legacy of 1776 and all this stuff about the first uh, nation, remember what, what Toussaint Louverture did um, in uh, uh, 1793 um, in Haiti uh, uh, and how valuable and relevant that is. Think about that as a piece. Now, you can read about it. I mean, I could, there's great letters. He wrote letters uh, in the Jura Mountains when he was up there freezing when the French took him from Haiti. Um, he's got letters. But now, how are you going to get someone who's new to engage in it? Right? It's the same way with Frederick Douglass. You, I mean, the young image of a Frederick Douglass, you, you know, all said, now you can see the fire in his eyes that, you know, Dr. Lerone Bennett talks about in Ebony. I mean, you see him. You can see him saying, agitate, 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 looking at you, you know, like, I'm serious. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I mean, yeah, I, I think it can be told. I think it's, it, it's, it's a piece where educators, uh, members of, you know, city fathers, what have you, everybody's got to get engaged in the right kind of space in this conversation to make this uh, make sense and make it correct. Um, and I think we can do it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we can. I think uh, historically uh, people always have. I mean, uh, I've had the question asked me, well, what, you know, what is, what's the importance of art? Why do we need art? And um, I think it's fundamental. It's fundamental to our development. It's fundamental to our understanding. Far back as you can remember in time, there's been art. You go to a, a prehistoric cave, you find a painting on the wall. That's how important art was to the development of people. So when you understand that and the importance of, and when I say art, I'm talking about all art, whether it's visual arts, performance art, it's important because it speaks to our mental and spiritual capacity beyond just the physical daily labors and relationships, it gets inside of our hearts, our minds, our spirits, and how we live and what life is about. I mean, those are some huge, huge subjects. Um, and artists continue to explore those and express those, whether it is, um, you know, something that is 
recognized or not. So you, you, think, you think we can tell the full story? I think we can. I think we have told the full story. You think I mean, we I have would, told? I, I think that the full story has been told. It hasn't been displayed everywhere, but it's been told. I mean, you can go in remote places and find the story. It just isn't in, you know, the main public square. So my, my uh, hope is to have that story be added to the main public square. I could go to black neighborhoods in Harlem and in Chicago and the South, and you can, you know, you can find outsider art. You can see all kind of great art that talks about the culture and the struggle and the triumphs, but it isn't in the main square. Well, then it's not being told then. If it's nobody being, sees it, it's, it's not being, being told. This is being told to a limited audience. And how do we expand that audience? You know, the, the, uh, the antebellum um, romanticized uh, art pieces, those are being told in the main public square. So we know about those. We see those all the time. I mean, if you think about it, and it's, okay. So if you think about it, uh, when you look at currency, all you really need to, to have is numbers to know this is a dollar, this is $100, this is $500, but there are paintings on currency, okay? And if I'm a little white kid and I'm looking at this dollar bill, this $100 bill, I'm like, wow, that looks like my grandfather. This is valuable. It says to me that I'm valuable, which is, a, which is fine. But if I'm a little black kid and I'm looking at that, I don't look like my grandfather. What do I see in society that tells me I'm valuable? Something as simple as a Band-Aid. Band-Aids, you put on your wound to camouflage your wound. But if Band-Aids are pink, how does that camouflage my wound? Psychological imagery, that's art, that's symbols, those are marks. Those are things that are in society that have reverberating effects upon all of us. And it's, it, it doesn't villainize anyone or victimize anyone. It's a situation that has a dual effect. So like I mentioned, for a young white kid, it's great, the entire world is about me. Everything is saying I'm great, so that makes me feel great, that makes me feel like I can be anything. That same image, that same society, that those same um, things that surround a black child is giving the opposite, that you're not important, that your hair uh, texture is not important, that you don't look, that these images, these antebellum caricatures are, uh, you know, you're a joke to be laughed at. And those hurtful images exist and they have a reverberating effect on us as people, but they affect other people too. They give them permission to negate you and say that you're less than. So the importance of art and the importance of telling the story and the importance of widening those perspectives, I think is paramount. And if we as artists have support for that, it's a great thing. But I'm of the mind that even if I don't have support for it, that'll be the legacy that I leave uh, when I'm gone. Dwight, what is your hope for black art and black public art? Hmm. My hope for black art and for black public art, um, for one, is to be in those spaces and places that do reach the masses um, so that you don't have to search too far to find out about your history. And so those that don't look like me um, or don't share the same stories as I do don't have to go completely out of their way either to find out about me. We walk, and like I think we said, we're one human race, right? So if we are all humans, we should all understand the dynamics of humanity. And so that's what I hope for, for, for art. Um, I'm, a, I'm initially from, from Texas. And um, the reason I fell in love with this city um, was because I found out more about myself here. Um, I found out more about my people here not that I didn't grow up around all black people in Texas, um, but what I did not have an understanding of or what I did not see, I wasn't able to step foot in my communities and see art um, at scale. 
I wasn't able to go to the Bronzevilles of the world or the Hyde Parks of the world and see myself celebrated. Um, it was much different for me. And so that's what I hope public art does provide to the next generation of youth um, all over the world, <laughs> not just in a magnificent city like Chicago, right? Um, as, hard as, it, as hard as it is to make it as an artist, um, even in a city like Chicago, um, there's so many uh, more opportunities. There's so many people that are looking for um, a deeper understanding. Um, and so that's what I, I hope for, for public art, is to expand and to, for it to reach those places that almost feel like the untouchables and the impossible. I just want to add one thing also. I think as a community, we have to almost demand that uh, our stories and narratives and our perspectives and our histories and our is, is part of that public. Because when you say public art, it's art that is supported by public dollars, tax dollars. We all pay taxes. We all, I mean, even people that are homeless pay sales taxes when they go and buy something. Everybody pays taxes. Everybody should have a voice in what's in the public square. So that means we need to be at the table. We need to be at the table. We need to be part of those decisions. Now, a private museum, you can't dictate what goes up in there. But a public park, a public street, the main square, there is a, a noticeable absence of us. There's a noticeable absence of a lot of cultures, but there's a, there's a extreme notable absence of uh, African-Americans in those histories and those narratives within those spaces, and it should be. So how, how do we get at the table? Uh, you know, um, it's beyond just making, making noise. I mean, you know, the, the nonprofits, the follow ones that are going after foundation grant money and things, you know, that's, that's a simple way to start, is, that, is to request resources that fund the right kinds of things. And you may say, well, that's, you know, <laughs> that's nothing. But I think everything counts, every step counts. And I think building off of what has been done counts. I think um, uh, talking to folks in, um, that are in political power throughout the city, getting on them and having direct conversation, raising the right kind of inquiries with them about what is in neighborhoods and what is not there. I think we can start to push there. I think we can further and further our, our, our make more, you know, sort, raise the right kinds of questions in the right kinds of spaces. It is our public space. We do pay. It's our tax dollars. So why wouldn't we have a, a say there? And I think we, we, we can promote that. We can ask our representatives to engage with that very question. I think that's part of how we get this in the political space where people are really dealing with um, how do we fund public uh, um, spaces that represent the entirety of the populace. Absolutely. Um, and many of those organizations who you submit grants and you solicit, uh, the people who run those organizations and make those decisions, they don't look like us. They don't have the sensibilities to our stories and they may not, you know, give you the same consideration that they do other artists. So how do we change that as well? You know, how do we become more uh, engaged in those, those situations? I'm curious uh, if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask our panelists. Does anybody have a question? Let me see. Raise your hand. No questions? Nobody has questions. Anything? Where are young people? Where are college students? Yeah, who needs extra credit in my class? Any, anybody? <laughs> I got you right here. Now you're talking. <laughs> yeah, extra credit. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. I'll be brave and, and launch the first question. <laughs> so thank you for doing that bus, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. I travel around the country, and I can only think of a few um, big monuments celebrating African-American women. One is Mary McLeod Bethune in Washington, D.C., in Capitol Hill. I saw a statue of Rosa Parks in Michigan, and I really can't think of anybody else right now, but there was one other woman. I just can't think of who it was. Can you share... Um, in your experience, any African-American women that are on display in a public square? Um, I've seen monuments of Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth. Um, there's a um, uh, artist friend of mine in California who, uh, who she's doing a lot of uh, monumental pieces that feature black women. 
Um, in this series that I'm doing, I'm trying to expand upon the, uh, the stories because we always see a sculpture of Dr. King, Harriet Tubman, on and on. But our story is so vast. Um, Dr. Daniel Hill Williams did the first open heart surgery. Why isn't there a monument of this brother? Before he did that, there was no procedure for open heart surgery. He didn't learn it at a medical school. He just cut somebody's chest open and started operating on it. Now, that's a standard that's taught at medical schools. Shouldn't there be some kind of monument to recognize him? There are so many of our young generation who don't even know who this black doctor is, never even heard of him. So there are so many stories that we have that is missing from the public narrative that I could easily do 500 sculptures. And if the monument only elicits a question, which is who is that? Then that starts a conversation about the dialogue and the history and where you belong within that story, within the human story. And I think that's what's important, that's what's missing. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, welcome to the DuSable Museum. I am Kim Delaney, the Director of Education and Programs here. So thank you all for being here tonight. I have a question uh, for you. So I was recently, you talked about monuments a few minutes ago. I was on a panel for the Lincoln Park uh, Committee about monuments. And I said to the, the wealthy, older, predominantly white audience that um, historically, white people have built monuments for white murderers and black murdered people. It's the truth. Majority of our monuments are for people who were uh, hein heinously murdered, right? We build monuments. What do you think, what we know, I'm also just recently retired professor of African American studies, right? I ran an African American studies department at Chicago State. So I've studied these things. What do you think is the role of art in shaping the future? In shaping the future, what, as, especially artists. What, what is your role? I know we have, we could dig out the safe, uh, deceased historical characters, right, that, that have been approved by the broader society and do uh, monuments of them, right? But what do you think is your role in using art to shape the future? Or do you think that's your role at all? Do you think you have a responsibility to use your art to shape? We could think of the 70s, James Brown said them loud, mm -hmm. say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, those type of things. What's your responsibility? as artists and then the professor as a, as a, as a teacher in shaping the future, not just uh, trauma porn. Mm -hmm. I think our, our role as artists is to be aware, um, be cognizant of what's happening around us, know the stories um, of the past, but also be very attentive to the present. And so as we see our people winning, as we see our people striving and working to be, to honor that, to celebrate that. And so as artists, you know, you have this skill set to show that visually. You have a skill set to put it in places. And I think it goes back to the earlier point of just doing it, um, not waiting, not asking for permission, um, being bold, being heroic, and using your skill set for something that um, ultimately is going to live on for many, many years. Um, but those stories have to be shared. They have to be celebrated right now. And as we do that, that helps inspire the next generation. It helps us um, gain an understanding of the, the superheroes that are around us every single day. Um, I think it goes unnoticed all the time. And I think that was an incredible point you just made around um, those monuments that we do see. I can't, I'm sitting here trying to think as I speak around um, a living hero <laughs> outside of Obama and, um, you know, some of the others that um, have been celebrated in that way. Um, they don't have to be the president of the United States. They're sitting among us. Um, it's about tapping into those insights. It's about tapping into their stories 
and allowing it to be shared through an artistic talent. And that's, I, I would say that's the reason why there is a, um, there's a bust of Kamala Harris behind me and that there is a full figure sculpture of uh, President Obama that's at the foundry uh, as we speak because there has to be a representation of um, where we are. We, we always see the representation of where we were. I have a painting in my gallery, the title of it is Escape. And it is a historical scene of a, um, of a captive from a slave ship who's jumped overboard. And you can see, so it's, you can see the, under, the figure underwater. It's from his perspective. And above the waterline, you see these three ships and you see Africa. And it's based on this poem. The poem says, living in the present, chained to the past. The 13th promised freedom, but it didn't last. We dreamed of equality, woke up fast, like sleeping in a feather bed full of broken glass. The plantation shut down, but no black man is free. The prison industrial is the new slavery. They substitute, substituted the noose and chain with crime scene tape. But today I will remember me, today I will escape. And on the uh, background on the left side of the painting is a city skyline. So it's a historical scene on, when you first look at it and then you look on the side and you see a city skyline. And it talks about the desire that our ancestors had to escape the reality of that struggle and that pain and the continuing desire that we have as contemporary culture to escape the lingering effects of that and to move on and grow as people. So there is this desire to escape. We should understand, know our history, but understand that that's just an, an experience within our lifetime that doesn't define who we are. Um, I like to say that we were prisoners of war as opposed to slaves. And when you understand it like that, once you set a prisoner of war free, he's no longer a prisoner. We have to, I think we have to change the narrative, change the perspective, change the things that we uh, continue to see and celebrate so that we can grow as people. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, I would agree with uh, everything, certainly that's, that's being sort of, sort of stated and situating this in the in right kind of context. I just, you know, I, I, there's just so many stories. That, that in my classes, I, I make sure we tell them. I mean, um, if we talk about black womanhood, not, we're not just not gonna deal, we're gonna deal with it in the United States, we're gonna deal with it in a broader sense. We're gonna talk about um, a, a nanny, Grandy Nanny, Nanny in the Maroons, if people have heard of all the work that she, does, she did. Or Donna Kempavita in the 1680s in West Central Africa, who in her own right initiates an Antonianism movement that, that is cr critical to Catholicism and the slavery that's um, in Africa, that's on the African side and start looking at the narratives on the African side. We engage ourselves with cosmology, spirituality, aspects of our African and our Caribbean experience that help to define our American experience too. It just, it, that's that broad story. And I think like something like, right away, I think about like 1619, which is, is, is the right point to, to get folks to start situating the questions and problems of our contemporary society in that context. But don't leave the Johnson family out of that conversation. Don't forget that there's a black man and who equivocates himself and his family to Angola and, and, and purchases some 900 acres of land. I mean, it, things will go awry, as we know. Slavery's gonna kick in. I mean, that's the inevitability. But let us be clear, especially in the context of talking about maybe the human family, we remind folks that there was a moment there where we didn't have to go this way. And there were real decisions that were made. We didn't have to go this route with the native folks that were here with the people in terms of integrating with them. We have to go this route in terms of captivity. There was an option there, just a moment, if folks had to maybe sort of thought differently about that. And you could say that's delusional, <laughs> but uh, it's part of the conversation. People gotta be looking at, and they're just the right sources. You gotta investigate the, as a historian. That's, that's, that's what I do, uh, um, investigate that kind of thing. Thank you. We have a question. I, want, I wanted to respond to the, the question about monuments and uh, art uh, in other places. And I want to speak to or talk about Montgomery, Alabama and Birmingham, Alabama, where Brian Stevenson has clearly told us and, or reminded us about the people that were hung county by county in the United States doesn't have a face, but there's a square with their name and I think the year. 
Uh, he also did some, and, he's, and if you know, he's done some work in regards to uh, civil rights and uh, legal work in Alabama. I'm not sure where, somewhere between Montgomery and Birmingham. But also in Montgomery, there's a statue of Rosa Parks everywhere. <laughs> there's not just one. <laughs> They're everywhere. But one in particular is adjacent to the auction block. But the auction block is now a fountain. But if you look at that auction block, Rosa Parks is to the immediate left. And if you look straight ahead, there's the capital of the state of Alabama. And you also have the works, uh, artworks on HBCU campuses. I'm more familiar with Hal Woodruff on Atlanta University's campus and the impact it had on us. I went to school there and we would see it every day because it was in the library. So there are some, I don't think it's been chronicled or we've been able to document and put in one place or a couple of places yeah. those works so we know where to go to look for it. That's my comment. Thank you. Uh, no question, just a comment? No question. No one who had a question. It was about public spaces in the park. That was my response. Okay. Yeah, I, I acknowledge. I mean, I know there's, there's plenty of art that speaks to our uh, histories, our struggle, our triumphs that's within our community. My uh, hope is to expand upon the visibility of that art and put it in the main public square so that we can widen this conversation and we can widen the understanding about the significance that we and the impact that we've had upon the creation of this of this government of this this country um, so me and my wife created a uh, almost a 50,000 square foot uh, design center it's like a mini merchandise mart on the south side. It's the Bordeaux Griffin Design Center. And uh, we're both creators. So I'm an artist, I'm a painter, I'm a sculptor. She's an interior designer and a product designer, a general contractor. And, uh, you know, when I found someone who was as passionate about their art as I was about mine, I said, I need to marry this woman. And uh, the space we tried to create a space that's a cultural oasis. There's a painting in, in this space that, uh, that I did years ago. It's called The White House, part of a series I did that was titled um, Ambiguous Reflections of Race and Identity, A Question of Color. All of the paintings were monochromatic. They were painted just black and white. So this is a huge six by nine black and white painting almost like an architectural elevation of the White House. And it's about that iconic building, the White House. And it features the house and the grounds and everything is black and white. And there's a small inclusion of Barack Obama on the White House grounds. Most people see it, they say, oh, I like that Obama painting. And I have to remind them, well, the title of that is the White House. It's not really Obama. But to me, that talks about how the presence of a black person in a room changes the dynamic. Um, the only hint of color is the back of Obama's neck because he's standing facing the White House. The windows are blacked out and on the ground, on the grass, are shadows cast and the shadows are uh, the shadows of Klansmen. And I did this piece to kind of talk about the historic White House, the iconic building, where it uh, was built by slaves, as we know. The first motion picture ever seen in this country, Birth of a Nation, was shown on the grounds of the White House which started the terrorist group, the Ku Klux Klan. So Barack Obama being introduced to this place had a monumental task. So the painting is monumental and he's small. And the shadows of those Klansmen on the ground spoke to this idea that the spirit or the ghost that have haunted this country since its beginning, since its inception, largely, largely uh, financed by the slavery of black people, continues to haunt, that spirit continues to haunt um, the uh, 
the president after Obama is a prime example of how that spirit continues to haunt us as a society. And the, uh, the cyclical instances of George Floyd or Trayvon Martin, all these things are reminders of that spirit that still exists. And like any other spirit or ghost that haunts you, if you ignore it, it'll continue to haunt you. It's like any sickness that you have. If you don't deal with the source of the sickness, you just cover it up, paint it up, it's gonna to continue to fester and haunt you. So my idea as an artist, first and foremost, is have a conversation with my community. Because I'm speaking from a perspective of a, an African American, I'm black, so I'm speaking to black people, I'm speaking about our stories, I'm having conversations that I would have with my wife, but I'm having them visually through art sculpture. And I wanna share those conversations with us as a community and also share those conversations with outside community. When I, when I started the series and I brought some people to the gallery and we talked about the art and I talked about this idea of paradigm shifts, I say, if you can imagine seeing a bus accident, you're standing on this side of the street and a person standing on that side of the street, you would, I would swear up and down it was the blue car that caused the accident. They would swear it was the red car. And we're both right, because we have different perspectives. If I can go across the street, I can see his perspective. If he could come over here, he could see my perspective. But we only see one side of the story. That's those romanticized sculptures in the public square. That's one side of the story. We need to see the full story. That's the importance of the art, because it changes our perspective, it changes our reality. So I think the importance of art uh, can have a huge impact on society. Last point, I, know I talk a lot. Yeah, last point, because we need to wrap it up. Yeah, I'm gonna make this last point because, you know, as an artist, I spend a lot of time in the studio, and a lot of time and <laughs> by myself. So when I get a chance to talk, it's like, okay, you hogging the mic. <laughs> um, oh, sure, I'm sorry. Hey, how you doing? I just have one question for you both. Sure. Uh, I know you had that, you said passion, and you know, you know, you had that real passion for the artist, you know, being an artist, you know, I want to know what was some of your ideas you was, you know, contemplating on uh, how to get your artwork seen to the world, you know what I'm saying? So, okay, so um, when I was a student, you know, like most students, I needed money. So I worked part time uh, first at a bank handing out flyers, and in Chicago, winners, that, did, that didn't last long. So I got a, a part-time job working as a, uh, working in a frame shop. So I learned how to do framing. And from there, I learned the whole framing business. So when I opened my first gallery, I was a framer and then maybe 20% of it was art sales. Now I have a program, I have a not-for-profit called Artist Life NFP. And in this program, we try to teach artists the business side of art, to your question. How do you, uh, you know, how do you create your portfolio? How do you write an artist statement? How do you, um, you know, what's the protocol in dealing with galleries and dealing with museums? How do you get into art fairs? How do you create art? How do you present it? How do you curate it? What is it? Why do you create it? We, we delve into all of those different questions. Um, I got a lot of those techniques in, in, uh, in my academic training, but we didn't focus a lot on the business side of art. And I think that's missing. Um, so we're trying to address that. Do we, do we have time for one more question? One, one more question? Hi, my name is Amaris. I'm a reporter at the Columbia Chronicle. And I've seen you all talk about the discussion of just um, monuments of people like Harriet Tubman. Excuse me, can you take your mask off? Oh. Monuments of people like Harriet Tubman or Barack Obama, but as black artists, I was wondering, um, do you think it's important to put your own stories into your art? And I guess how that can affect the conversation and pres preservation of just uh, black art um, during current times. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> sorry, um, that's, that's an incredible question. I think um, capturing your own stories um, as artists, to be honest, well, I'm gonna speak personally, it's probably one of the most intimidating things um, in my practice of art, right? Thinking deeply enough about myself, not what I'm seeing, but what I'm feeling. And 
telling that story visually um, for people to respond to, for people to react to. It's extremely important though. Um, my personal perspective as a young black man um, should be told. It should be shared. It should be uplifted. It should be in public spaces. It should be in galleries and it should be um, seen nationally. Um, and so I spent a lot of time um, writing. I spent a lot of time uh, thinking critically around you know, the things that are happening around me in the city of Chicago and beyond. And the more we can figure out how the world we're living in relates to our, ourselves, um, we begin, those stories begin to connect to other people just like you. And so um, I think to your question, it, it is important to, to share those stories about ourselves and to um, basically, if not painting a, a self-portrait, it doesn't necessarily have to be literal, it does have to um, you know, internalize your own thoughts and bring it to life visually. Yeah, and I would, I would just add uh, that most of the work that I do is stories about myself. Um, these particular pieces that are part of this series kind of speak to this historical narrative and what's missing in society. So um, they center around our historical and our contemporary presence. But um, even in these pieces, it's still about myself because their story is my story. All right, uh, gonna wrap up and say thank you all for joining us. Uh, let's give a big round of applause. Gerald Griffin, Robert Hansard, and Dwight White. Thank you for giving us your perspective. Very, very needed. And Pat, you wanna close it out? And please give Leanne a hand for moderating an amazing discussion. Um, as I said, I want to thank you guys for coming out. I want to thank the pigment team in the room. Uh, there's Simone, Nalani, Veronica, and they're waving in the back, so they've all been integral to making this day happen, so I want to give a thanks to them. I encourage you, okay. Uh, please look at the cards. As I said, we have other conversations this month. Uh, Joe Jones and his team in the back, Saran, are filming this. This will go up on our YouTube site. So if you pull up Pigment on YouTube, you, this conversation will go up once it's edited. I will tell you, we launched a conversation today that Gerald had with Haki Mabuti, if anybody's familiar with Third World Press in the room. And so I set that to launch on October 1st. So if you go to our Pigment INTL YouTube, you will see that conversation. And this one will be up as well in a couple of weeks. But um, we thank you for being here. Uh, we are very appreciative of the students that came. If any of you want to talk to any of the artists for the stories you're doing, we appreciate that. And I'm sure they would love to talk to you as well. So have a wonderful evening.